오후 세션을 시작하겠습니다. 저는 신경외과 김현진입니다. 어, 오전에는 브레인 튜머에 관해서 인뮤널러지, 케미스트리 뭐 이런 굉장히 복잡한 공부를 했는데 오후에는 스파인 파트로 스파인 파트는 이뮤널러지나 케미스트리보다는 피직스에 가깝고 물리에 가까운 일이 많습니다. 그래서 조금 오전하고 오후는 내용이 많이 다를 것 같습니다. 오후에는 어, 그 마이아미에서 오신 우리 그 서, 어, 어, 서플버거 교수님을 모셔가지고 두 가지 연재를 듣겠습니다. It's a great honor to introduce uh, the famous spine surgeon from the uh, United States. Uh, his name is Harry Suffelberger. He was uh, educated in Emory, Atlanta. And he moved to Miami. And uh, he stayed almost 40 years at the Miami, Florida. And uh, he studied and uh, operated and uh, doing uh, research work at the Miami uh, um, University of Miami, Florida. He is now the uh, clinical professor at the uh, Department of Orthopedics and the Rehabilitation at the Miami University. And uh, now he is a director of uh, a Division of Spinal Surgery at the Children's, Children's Hospital at Miami. Uh, we will, uh, he will uh, give us two topics today. One is posterior treatment of uh, Schaumann's and other kyposis. And the second topic is lumbar degenerative kyposis. Uh, after his presentation, we will have a short question and discussion. Uh, Schaffelberger, please. Thank you very much, sir. And it's, it's a pleasure to be back in Seoul, and it's a pleasure to be at the Neurosurgery Update 2006. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Chung and I spoke the other day, yesterday, and neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery is certainly coming much closer together uh, in the area of spinal surgery. And I, this is due to, to several factors, but in particular, the advent of the pedicle screw and uh, the large amount of spinal instrumentation that has grown out of that. So I hope my two talks from an orthopedic point of view will be useful to you as neurosurgeons. And I'm going to talk first about uh, a, a general approach to problems in kyphosis. And, uh, most of the spinal problems we see are, are really problems in kyphosis. Uh, the only problem in lordosis that I'm familiar with is the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So kyphosis is the primary problem we see every day. Uh, life is a kyphosing process. As we all age, we get more and more kyphotic. So let's, let's uh, look at the treatment of sagittal plane deformity and, and the goal uh, of this is, is, is restoration of the sagittal plane or the sagittal profile. And to accomplish that, it's necessary to displace the sagittal axis at least posterior to the hip joints as depicted by this line. So everything we do should be designed to displace the sagittal weight-bearing axis posterior to the hip joints. And let's look at just briefly at short segment kyphosis, and mostly I'm going to deal with long segment. And short segment may be spondylolisthesis, degenerative disease, iatrogenic uh, kyphosis, and a number of other things. And, and just as an example of uh, a problem in kyphosis in short segment, I'll use this high dysplastic spondylolisthesis, which really is a problem in kyphosis. You see that the lumbosacral junction is severely kyphotic, both in the MRI and in the plain film. 
and our goal should be to uh, restore the normal lordotic relationship, number one. And number two, uh, as much reduction as is, is uh, commensurate with being, with being safe should be attempted. And this short segment uh, was done with a series of procedures, decompression, disectomy, excision, sacral dome, reduction with pedicle screws, as you see on the right, uh, placement of a cage to establish the anterior column support, and finally, posterior compression and a posterior lateral fusion. And we see significant improvement in the sagittal alignment at the lumbosacral junction, and at two years, a very good fusion, fusion mass. And in this area, short segment kyphosis reduction, I think, always requires an anterior column support that is structural. And this can be done either from the posterior view as illustrated or by a direct uh, anterior approach in an anterior inner body fusion. Next, we'll, we'll leave the short segment and look at long segment kyphoses. And up until approximately four or five years ago, the standard of care was a combined anterior uh, disectomy and release procedure combined with a posterior instrumentation. And the reasons that that was accepted are Dr. David Bradford of San Francisco's two articles, one in 1975 showing very poor results with posterior only surgery, and his second article in 1980 showing much improved results with an anterior uh, release procedure. So anterior posterior surgery has been the standard for most long segment problems in kyphosis. However, Alberto Ponti of, of Italy in 1985 published a work in which he did a particular osteotomy which he described and posterior instrumented spinal fusion with really excellent results. And this was kind of lost because it, it was published in, in a relatively obscure location. But gradually, this has become uh, more apparent around the world. And the, the osteotomy that Dr. Ponte described really is not a Smith-Peterson osteotomy. It's, uh, it goes from, from the midline through the facet joint, as illustrated here. And Smith-Peterson's osteotomy was actually just a, uh, a division of the lamina described in uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And Smith-Peterson's osteotomy hinges uh, on the posterior aspect of the body through the disc space. And the Ponte osteotomy uh, does not hinge in the anterior, in, on the anterior at all. It closes the anterior column of the spine. The other parts of the Ponte osteotomy are segmental fixation with screws. And the mechanics involve cantilever and compression mechanics. Uh, Professor Harms and Alberto Ponti had a debate at the Scoliosis Research Society in New York. The uh, question was, anterior surgery is not required in Schurman's kyphosis. And Professor Harms and Alberto Ponti both agreed that this was true and that anterior surgery was not necessary. Uh, Ponti, in a personal communication, states that the osteotomy should be done at every level. You can make it as wide as you want, going from pedicle to pedicle if necessary, and there are no limits to the severity of the kyphosis that can be corrected by this posterior-only approach. So the Ponte procedure actually shortens the posterior column. It doesn't lengthen the anterior column, and segmental pedicle fixation is an integral part. This is an artist's rendition of a kyphotic thoracic spine, and this shows the ponte osteotomy done at, at every, every level in the sagittal plane and in the AP. And this is, it's not very difficult to do. It probably takes about five minutes a level. This is the intraoperative picture. We have the, the facet joints have been destroyed with an electric uh, nine millimeter burr. The ball probe is in the facet joint. And this is the ligamentum flavum exposed. And the next step is to excise the ligamentum flavum and then using the kerosene rongeur, extend the osteotomy laterally through the facet into the foramen bilaterally. 
uh, the usual width is is approximately uh, six to ten millimeters. And I say this can be done quickly. It's it's easy, and it's it's quite fast. And this shows the completed osteotomy with the gel foam in, and the ball probe lying across the osteotomy. So again, the this is an osteotomy through the facet joint to the foramen and then bilateral screws are placed at every level. Once the osteotomies are completed and the screws placed, it's a relatively simple matter to place the rods, and it's usually easier to place right and left rod at the same time and do this simultaneously. So the rods are placed as shown, and we can uh, apply compression over the proximal uh, segment and then perform the cantilever maneuver and enter the distal implants and then uh, apply compression below. So the mechanics of this are cantilever and compression. And this is the operative picture of the completed uh, procedure. So in, in summary, I'd, li I'd like to share my experience with uh, a little, uh, approximately 32 patients who had the Ponte procedure for Schurman's disease. This was uh, consecutive patients beginning at the end of 2000, proceeding up through mid-2003. Uh, these were mostly teenagers, uh, predominantly male, and minimum 24-month uh, follow-up. Uh, the surgical time is about seven hours. It's not a particularly bloody uh, procedure. The hospital stay average is five uh, days. Uh, I use all polyaxial screws, and the rods were either a 5 millimeter stainless or 5.5 millimeter stainless or titanium rod. And there's no brace or cast utilized afterwards. Of the 32, 26 were pure thoracic Schurmans, and six were thoracolumbar. And the kyphosis in the thoracic spine averaged nearly 80 degrees before and 38 degrees afterwards and at final evaluation. Uh, the thoracolumbar kyphosis in the six patients who had that condition averaged about 53 degrees before and 15 degrees after with no change at final follow-up. So the ability to correct the kyphosis from this approach is, is quite excellent. If you look at the apical zone, uh, the kyphosis across the mean four and a half segments was 60 degrees or 14 degrees per segment, and it was 20, 23 degrees or five degrees per segment afterwards. So you can anticipate routinely a correction of about 10 degrees per osteotomy. Uh, in this group, there is only one, one patient who had uh, post-operative tachycardia and costochondral pain which resolved there were no neurologic complications, no reoperations. There was one junctional deformity, which I'll show you. And at the last follow-up, no one was on medication, and uh, everyone returned to most of their pre-surgery activities. So the outcomes from the patient's point of view was quite good also. This is an example of a thoracic uh, Schurman's. Uh, this is the x-rays, 80 degrees, afterwards corrected down to 35 degrees, and the clinical appearance has improved considerably. And this is another example, thoracic Schurman's kyphosis, 75 degrees, and one year after the Ponte procedure, it's been corrected and maintained at 40 degrees. This is one junctional problem that occurred. This was the initial pre-op in June, uh, approximately 80 degrees kyphosis, and immediately post-operative, the alignment looked great. The disc below uh, the distal instrumented vertebra was lordotic, and the alignment above was satisfactory. And we see a uh, progressive subluxation or tilt at the superior instrumented level. Uh, by a year, this was stable and asymptomatic, and nothing was done about it. Unfortunately, the same patient had a distal uh, junctional problem also. We note the disc in June is quite uh, nicely lordotic. Four months later, it's beginning to become kyphotic, and this is stabilized by May, and this is likewise asymptomatic. So this may be just a radiographic curiosity, but I think uh, one would be concerned about the ability of this disc to stand up for a long time. 
a couple uh, questions on doing this. How, how is the distal uh, fusion level decided? And for the past several years, have used the sagittal stable vertebra in which a, a vertical line is constructed from the posterior margin of the sacrum. And whatever vertebra this bisects is going to be the sagittal vertical, sagittal stable vertebra and should be the distal end vertebra. Uh, Dubasay taught that the distal or the, the last disc included in the fusion should be lordotic, and this uh, almost, well, this always will meet that rule also. So construction of this line will tell us the distal end vertebra. The s second question that arises is how many screws should you use? Uh, what's the most efficient pattern? And David Polly of Washington, D.C. has uh, a couple of mechanical studies on this. And he initially recommended uh, a pattern like this with uh, skipping or, or not putting bilateral screws across the apical zone. And I think this, this really this, it was good in the laboratory, but it do, doesn't make any clinical sense. In This is the most rigid area, and it's, you need to have implants bilaterally across the most rigid area. So I think that the best screw pattern for Shoreman's is uh, segmental or bilateral screws at every level as shown here. And this is an example of the, the polyapical pattern. So let's look at some, some other examples where uh, the ponty type osteotomy is, use, is useful. This is a patient with a reflex sympathetic dystrophy who had thoracolumbar laminectomy on two occasions for placement of a uh, spinal cord stimulator who developed this post-laminectomy kyphosis. And this previously uh, would almost always be dealt with with a an combined anterior-posterior procedure. And uh, this was handled very nicely from the back only with multiple level ponte osteotomies. And this is a five millimeter rod which has corrected and maintained the post laminectomy kyphosis. She is in a wheelchair because of her reflex sympathetic dystrophy, but is seated very well. This is a idiopathic scoliosis, which occasionally is kyphotic, as we see here. And the kyphosis is over 60 degrees. Uh, with normal thoracic kyphosis being up to 40. And this was done posteriorly also using the ponte osteotomies with correction of the kyphosis down to 30 degrees and complete correction of the scoliosis. This is a, a neuromuscular patient with an unclassifiable muscular dystrophy with rather significant scoliosis and a very significant proximal thoracic kyphosis. And, uh, in years past, this would require a combined anterior-posterior procedure. These are the bending x-rays. And this is her clinical appearance on the operating table. And I think we can appreciate her very significant high thoracic kyphosis very well. And this was done with multiple uh, ponte-type osteotomies from the back and bilateral pedicle screw instrumentation with satisfactory correction of the scoliosis but the kyphosis has been corrected from an initial 85 down to a normal 35 degrees with really excellent sagittal balance. And seeing her clinical photographs, we can appreciate the uh, very good sitting balance she has. Congenital kypho kyphoscoliosis can also be managed uh, from the back with the Ponte procedure if it is not too severe. And this is a 14-year-old with the diastematomyelia, which had been operated with a previous laminectomy and had pre-progressive kyphosis and became parapyretic. These are the plain films, and we note the uh, thoracolumbar junction kyphosis. We can see the long laminectomy, which had been done, and these are the sagittal and coronal uh, CTs, which shows the, the hemivertebra. Rather than electing to excise the hemivertebra due to the long kyphosis. We elected to do multiple level ponte procedures 
uh, and reduction of the kyphosis. This is for MRI, and you see the, the duplication of the spinal cord. The diastematomyelia had been re spike had been removed. So this was done all posterior with multiple level ponte osteotomies and segmental pedicle screw fixation. And we see satisfactory improvement in the kyphosis. And by three months, she had had complete neurologic recovery. And this was simply realignment posterior to diminish the compression of spinal cord. So I think po posterior only surgery for a variety of etiologies of kyphosis is, is effective in obtaining correction and in main, maintaining correction. I think it's a very safe procedure. The complications have been minimal and uh, the junctional deformity does occur but does not seem to be a clinical problem but a radiographic curiosity. So what, what do we do when uh, it, in, in our judgment the multiple level ponte osteotomies uh, are inadequate to correct the amount of kyphosis present. And we have two, two other uh, weapons or techniques that we can employ, one being the pedicle subtraction osteotomy or subtotal corpectomy. And finally, in very long uh, cases with, usually with neurologic involvement, combined anterior and posterior resection is necessary. This is a diagram of, of the pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Uh, the uh, a laminectomy is done. Uh, the pedicles are exposed bilaterally. Uh, the vertebral body is exposed around laterally to the to around the corner anteriorly bilaterally, and then the the wedge is taken out beginning at the pedal pedicles and ending at the anterior body. The osteotomy is closed. Uh, this is a completely posterior shortening osteotomy, giving a bone on bone situation with. Uh, almost always complete healing. And you can predictably obtain approximately 30 degrees correction by one uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Uh, we can make a little bigger and, and do a subtotal corpectomy uh, just by extending it to the, to the end plate proximally and distally and still hinging it at the anterior vertebral body and we can increase the correction to some 40 to 45 degrees by enlarging the osteotomy. The uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy is quite useful. It does not rely on disc mobility. Uh, it has an excellent fusion environment. The posterior elements are resected along the lines of the osteotomy and then it's necessary to undercut these to protect the, the neural elements and you prefer to do a symmetrical uh, osteotomy around the anterior apex, particularly if there's no associated coronal plane uh, deformity. And this is approximately the way you would want to cut the osteotomy, uh, angled up 15 degrees from top and bottom, closing it, giving you 30 degrees of correction. If we want to expand that to a subtotal Corpectomy. This is very similar to the pedicle subtraction. There's probably more risk of, of crowding the neural, neural elements. Uh, the posterior elements need to be undercut to protect the, the neural structures. And we need to be very careful that, that there's no compression by the edges. And symmetry around the anterior apex is also desirable without coronal deformities. And this shows the angles of the osteotomy, closing it to obtain approximately 50 degrees of correction. It's possible to do an asymmetric pedicle subtraction osteotomy or subtotal corpectomy if there's a coronal plane deformity, and we might design it like this. Here we have to be very cognizant, again, of the, of the neural elements and be sure there's no compression by the edges. So this is our, our plan, coronal and sagittal. It says intraoperative with the osteotomy has been completed. This is intraoperative. This is L5 root, the dura L5 root, and L4 is going to be up there. This is prior to closure, 
And here the osteotomy has been completed. You see L5, L4, uh, the edges of, of the dura are not under any compression. So in the using pedicle subtraction techniques, this is, is typically done at lumbar two to lumbar four, although it certainly can be uh, performed anywhere in the thoracic spine. Uh, you can accomplish two-plane correction by making asymmetric cuts. Uh, this can be performed with prior laminectomy. It, you, one just has to dissect and free up all the neural elements. And this allows posterior-only correction of very significant deformities. This is a uh, syndromic condition called Melnick Needle Syndrome, which is uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia and usually associated with a very significant and highly structural kyphosis and we can appreciate the the large kyphotic gibbous and this is the radiology with the very large kyphosis with the apex at uh, approximately lumbar one and CT scans and this is, is afterwards, and this was done all posterior with a pedicle subtraction osteotomy at the apex. Her pedicles were so small I was unable to get screws in several of the levels and accordingly hooks were, were used. And I was very happy we did, did not do an anterior approach as she was intubated on ventilator support for 28 days after this procedure. And this is at two years. Uh, everything remains exactly as it was. And this is her clinical appearance with significant improvement in her uh, kyphotic posture. This is another problem in kyphosis. Uh, this is neurofibromatosis with uh, the scoliosis that you see and the thoracolumbar junction kyphosis. Neurologically, the young lady was normal. Her MRI was n normal with no neurofibroma uh, visualized. And she had no other manifestations except the kyphoscoliosis. I think we can see cafe au lait spot here, and she had multiple cafe au lait spots. And her bending demonstrates the rigidity, and I think we can appreciate the very wedge-shaped uh, apical vertebra at, at thoracic 12. And this was done with uh, a T12 pedicle subtraction osteotomy and multiple pontiosteotomies and segmental pedicle screws with really excellent correction of the uh, scoliosis and production of normal sagittal contours. And her clinical appearance was uh, really quite good. It was uh, a four-day hospitalization, uh, no immobilization, no neurologic injury. So I think we can see that the the pedicle subtraction osteotomy is a very powerful tool for coronal and sagittal deformity correction when you judge that the multiple level ponte osteotomy is insufficient. Finally, we have uh, combined anterior and posterior procedures and uh, certainly in my practice, uh, this is a rarity today, whereas five or 10 years ago, this was uh, virtually all the time. I think I reserve combined anterior and posterior procedures in kyphosis uh, when, for when anterior decompression is required over several segments, and these patients are almost always myelopathic, and when posterior column shortening is required to obtain correction of deformity. This is probably the most severe kyphosis that I've ever seen. This is, is osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, you see the head is here, and we have this approximately 160 degree kyphosis. And she was profoundly myelo myelopathic. Uh, you see her f lower extremities from her osteogenesis imperfecta. But she was wheel wheelchair bound from the my myelopathy and not from the lower extremity problems. Uh, she had an anterior four and a half level corpectomy uh, and then placed in very light halo traction and approximately four weeks later had a posterior resection of uh, approximately four levels 
and then reduction of the kyphosis as seen. Uh, she's now approximately nine months following surgery and has significant recovery of neurologic function. She's regained her bowel and bladder function and most of the motors in her lower extremities w function, although she remains non-ambulatory. And I just, I don't think there would be any other way to deal with this uh, other than a combined multi-level resection. And this is another severe sagittal deformity. We have this scoliosis, and this is a congenital scoliosis. There's a hemivertebra in here. He had a failed posterior fusion and had a moderate myelopathy. Uh, he was ambulatory with, with two crutches, and he did have bowel and bladder function. This is a CT scan showing the multiple vertebral abnormalities uh, and the MRI showing the compression over several levels. So he had a, an anterior four-level corpectomy followed by posterior excision of four levels and segmental pedicle instrumentation with really marked improvement of the kyphosis. Uh, he had increased deficit after surgery. This is his uh, myelogram immediately after surgery, which really looked pretty good. And he, he gradually improved his neurologic function, including bladder control over approximately two weeks and then had sudden deterioration uh, of the function that he recovered. And he had a large epidural hematoma, and that was ex evacuated. Further decompression was carried out. And this is his, his alignment at the present time. He's regained significant neurologic function. He's able to walk with one crutch. He's regained bowel and bladder. Uh, control and function. So these l large resections in the, in the myelopath myelopathic patient uh, are possible. They're certainly uh, very risky. Uh, you must be uh, pay great attention to the decompression both from the, from the anterior and the decompression from the posterior, being sure that there's no impingement on the dura by the non-resected areas. And I think it's important to, to uh, divide the ribs where the vertebral column resection has been done. And I think it's also mandatory to maintain the systolic or the mean blood pressure at 85 to 90 millimeters of mercury during your manipulations. And usually, usually uh, pharmacological agents are required to get the blood pressure that high. Uh, but this can be a gratifying procedure and certainly gives us a, another powerful tool for correction of severe deformity with decompression of the spinal cord. So in, in summary, uh, the goal is restoration of the sagittal profile. And we, we have a variety of methods to do this. The uh, multiple level ponte type osteotomies with segmental pedicle screw instrumentation is the, the number one uh, procedure, and I would choose this whenever I feel that you can get adequate correction. Remember, you can obtain approximately 10 degrees per level from this. When that's insufficient, I would resort to the pedicle subtraction osteotomy or subtotal corpectomies, and you can gain between 30 and 45 or 50 degrees cor correction from a single pedicle subtraction osteotomy, which combined with multiple ponte osteotomies over several segments uh, gives you the possibility to get 80 or 90 degrees of correction relatively easy. Finally, when we have significant myelopathy over multiple segments and decompression is required over multiple segments, I think this is the place for uh, anterior and posterior resections. And this is a very hazardous procedure with, with a, a high potential for neurologic injury. But by doing careful surgery, uh, maintaining the blood pressure, and very good monitoring, we should be able to, to manage this deformity also. 
the choice of the procedure really depends on the degree of the deformity, uh, the absence or, pr or presence of, of myelopathy, and the number of segments involved. So thank you for your attention. You want to go on to the next one or stop yeah, for questions? Yes. Go on next to topic. <clears throat> okay, the, the next topic is, is degenerative lumbar scoliosis or de novo scoliosis in the adult. And for those of you who attended the, the seminar yesterday, day afternoon, uh, an excellent talk was given on degenerative uh, kyphosis or sagittal plane deformity. And I'm going to take, take this topic at, at a little different uh, angle. We're going to talk about the, the pathogenesis or, the, or how this is produced and therapeutic considerations in degenerative lumbar scoliosis. Uh, the, the, the treatment of degenerative lum, lumbar disease includes these diagnoses, uh, including degenerative scoliosis. And I'm only going to discuss in terms of treatment fusion and will not discuss disc replacement. And these are degenerative scoliosis or, or long segment uh, conditions and are probably not amenable to disc replacement, at least in most person's hands. So the, the definition of uh, de novo scoliosis is the onset of, the adult onset of deformity with uh, generalized spondylosis in the lumbar spine. And this has both coronal and sagittal plane abnormalities, and we see the progression over 10 years from a relatively normal spine to a significantly deformed spine. Uh, in order to qualify for the diagnosis, it has to have the adult onset, usually in the fifth decade. There should be no previous deformity. The curves are generally lumbar, and lum lumbar spondylosis needs to be present. This uh, is an expression of multi-segmental asymmetrical disc degeneration and disc collapse. And we see this significant change over a 10-year period in the coronal plane from almost no deformity to very severe deformity. In the sagittal plane, uh, we see uh, decrease in disc space, loss of lordosis, and eventually upper lumbar kyphosis, which is noted here, again developing over a 10-year period. The typical radiology shows two lumbar curves uh, as seen here with frequently with a junctional listhesis. Uh, there'll be loss of lordosis on the lateral, and we'll have generalized spondylosis on MRI studies. <coughs> Keith Bridwell proposed a classification a few years ago, and this is graded one to four, uh, and several factors are cons considered. And that will include the coronal deformity or the scoliosis increasing from one to four, the amount of lordosis decreasing from one to four, the amount of stenosis increasing from one to four, and the junctional subluxation increasing from type one to four. So Bridwell's classification is a one through four grade based upon the anatom on the radiographic findings. In addition, Bridwell considers other, other things, and this is physiologic age, uh, the presence of comorbidities, and particularly the, the family history of longevity. A second classification was proposed in 1997 by Jorge Izaza, uh, which is again z zero through three, based primarily on the 
uh, amount of scoliosis in the oolisthesis. This has not been accepted. It really ex ignores the sagittal plane, which is where one of the primary deformities is. So we, w we would prefer uh, Keith Bridwell's classification of degenerative scoliosis. Now, the, the pathomechanics are, are outlined here and involve the, the primary event is going to be multiple level disc degeneration. And this results in uh, loss of the tension band principle and loss of the load sharing principle as we get uh, more kyphosis. And one of these leads to the other. Uh, this overloads, you know, actually this gives us an increased shear force per segment, which is a definition of segmental instability. And this overloads the uh, posterior facet joints and we get secondary degenerative changes. So this all starts with asymmetrical disc degeneration. We look at the disc briefly and I'm sure you're familiar with this. The function of the disc is, or the, the anatomy of the disc is, is really unique and it provides segmental mobility with segmental stability. The disc generally acts in distraction and it permits stability while permitting motion. The functions of the intact disc are to resist compression, resist bending, torsion, and shear forces, which it is very well designed to do. However, as the disc degenerates, which it does in all of us, it loses the ability to resist these forces. There's a certain amount of physiologic motion which the disc permits and uh, there's a, a few degrees of physiologic translation which is allowed and a few uh, degrees of sagittal rotation or flexion extension with which the disc permits. If we look at the uh, motion segment or functional spinal unit where there are a number of articles where the, the disc is quoted to bear 80 percent of the the load through the spine and the posterior elements approximately 20 percent. An efficient tension band consisting of the muscles and the uh, posterior facet joints is also necessary and the efficiency of the tension band depends on the pressure stability of the anterior column. Which means to say if the, this, if the anterior column doesn't resist compressive forces, the tension band will be not functional. If the tension band and the weight and the load sharing principles are not in play, then we're unable to uh, resist shear forces, which are the primary forces in the lower lumbar spine. And this it sets up a vicious circle, which, uh, is, which produces the degenerative deformities. So the decrease in the tension band, the loss of load sharing, and no shear resistance all overloads the posterior column. And this is segmental instability resulting in deformity and eventually canal compromise. If we look at the, the global picture of the spine and the patho pathomechanical effects, as we get, this is the normal, the sagittal line should be posterior to the hip joint, as we get degeneration, this becomes anteriorly displaced, more de more dege which leads to more degeneration and more anterior translation of the gravity line. This also serves to increase the bending motion and shear forces. So this is, is a vicious circle that there's really no way to stop. So again, asymmetric disc degeneration is the pathogenetic event and then time and progressive aging produces uh, the possibly severe deformities. If we look at this diagrammatically, unilateral disc degeneration creates a lateral uh, deformation in, this, in, the lat, in, the, in the sagittal plane. We get a kyphosis and we get some loss of contact due to, to rotary changes in the facet joint. And this creates a rotational instability and progressive deformity. So the unilateral kyphoscoliosis causes a rotational instability resulting in increasing bending moments, decreasing shear resistance, and progressive deformity. So 
the, the changes are in the three dimensions, the coronal, sagittal, and axial changes, and the motion segment functions deteriorate, progressive deformities are inevitable as shown. So in the motion segment, we have an ineffective tension band, no load sharing, no shear resistance, and no rotational stability. We've seen that. So if we go from the, from the etiologic or the pathogenetic factor, uh, what are the prognostic signs? And in, in general, there, this is going to be a progressive uh, condition. And if someone lives long enough, they will probably have significant problems from it. But bad, bad prognosis for, for progression is cob, cob angle over 30 degrees, moderate rotary deformities, loss of lumbar lordosis, and lateral rotary listhesis. And the treatment is really not so easy. And the symptoms are going to be back pain, and you may or may not have uh, neurogenic claudication, and the other symptom is deformity. And uh, I think r it's rare. It's it's rare to get uh, neurologic deficits from this condition, and I think the decision-making process are primarily quality of life issues. Is the patient able to do most of what they want? Uh, relatively comfortable, uh, sacrifices can be made and some activities avoided. But the decision for surgery or non-surgical non treatment is primarily quality of life issues. The non-surgical treatment is not, there is not very much activity alteration, uh, symptomatic uh, non-steroidals, corsets, and epidural may provide temporary relief for the claudication symptoms or leg pain. Should we decide for, for surgery, uh, we need to, to establish some goals. And uh, ideally, we would want to correct the pathomechanics, which requires restoration of coronal and sagittal alignment, posterior displacement of the sagittal weight-bearing line, act line, and decompression as indicated. We also must restore the biomechanics by restoring the anterior column stability, allowing load sharing and shear resistance, and reestablishment of the posterior tension band. So the, the surgical goal should be correction of deformity and segmental instability, uh, correction of leg pain by correcting stenosis and segmental instability, and if neurogenic claudication is present, uh, correction of the stenosis by decompression. The patient preference is primarily two. They want pain relief, but they also want realignment. And we see here marked improvement in the clinical appearance with modest improvement in the radiographic appearance. So re restoration of sagittal contours. Uh, I think we discussed the, the ponty-type osteotomies, which is mandatory in this condition. I think that anterior surgery or multiple level T-lift is also mandatory, and this would require anterior disectomy and structural inner body grafts. Uh, a pedicle subtraction osteotomy can be added if sufficient correction of the kyphosis or restoration of the lordosis cannot be done by the combined ponte osteotomies and disectomies. If we look at sagittal contours. Uh, the appropriate sagittal alignment requires the C7 plumb pass through the superior cortex of S1 or posterior to the hip joints. Acceptable sagittal alignment is probably anything that's posterior to the hip joints. How much lordosis do you need? Uh, in the normal spine, you generally have a mean of 30 degrees kyphosis and about 60 degrees of, of lumbar lordosis. So we have generally 30 degrees more lordosis than kyphosis. So if the thoracic kyphosis is 45 degrees and you want to make 70 or 75 degrees of lumbar lordosis, and I think the biggest error technically is made is, is production of inadequate lordosis. 
Steve Andre has a trigonomic, trigonometric calculation for sagittal alignment in which you can uh, calculate the amount of lordosis necessarily, seria, and what osteotomies are necessary to produce this. Well, coming to our surgical choices, uh, these are listed. It's plus or minus for de decompression. If there's central canal stenosis, certainly you need a direct decompression. If uh, it's for anal stenosis, this may be able to be corrected by realignment. So the procedures can be posterior only, posterior with T lifts, anterior, then posterior, posterior, anterior, or a three stage posterior, anterior, posterior procedure. And any of these can be con combined with the pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Uh, my personal preference is for a three stage same day procedure. Uh, which would be going in the back first with decompression screws and graft, then the second stage would be multiple uh, A-lifts, and the third stage would be rod placement. Uh, and the reason for this, I think in, in these degenerative conditions, you can reliably produce lordosis only by uh, removal of the, of the anterior longitudinal ligament and annulus, anterior distraction and then when you do anterior distraction you require inner body grafts to maintain that and this also allows very good grafting of the inner space with either autogenous iliac bone or with uh, with the BMP and this this is an example uh, I apologize for the film but this is is the sagittal plane and it, it's not a very bad uh, lordosis, but this is supine in the operating room, and the coronal shows a, a modest scoliosis. Here the pontiosteotomies have been done, uh, the pedicle screws placed, and then the A-lifts with cages done, and we see the sagittal contour has been changed significantly, and the scoliosis has been corrected, and this is all accomplished simply by restoration of disc space height and placement of structural grafts. And note there are no rods in place. So this is all done by adequate releases, anterior distraction, and harms cages. So the, th the three-stage surgery is as shown. And we'll, uh, I'll show you that this is technically feasible. It best restores the spinal mechanics. And I think you'll see it's a safe procedure also. The first procedure from the back, uh, you take the bone graft, do the ponte type osteotomies, and place your screws, and close the incision. And this generally, and, and you can also do any decompression that's indicated. And this takes approximately, I don't know, three hours, two and a half to three hours. The patient is in, then re repositioned and I prefer the, the paramedian approach, staying below the diaphragm, uh, expo and you can do lumbar two through the sacrum very easily by this approach. It's almost bloodless, and each disc can be removed, anterior distraction carried out, and then the, the, the harms cage is placed, and I prefer two small harms cages because that uh, gives a place that you can put an instrument to distract the disc place. This typically takes about two hours to do, to do the four levels. And then the patient is repositioned, the, the rod is placed and compression applied, which loads the anterior graft and establishes a tension band, and the posterior lateral bone graft can be placed. So this three-stage same-day surgery allows us to restore sagittal contours via releases or osteotomies. It provides uh, anterior load sharing via st a structural graft, and it reestablishes the tension band. And this is a typically a five millimeter rod. I'd like to share with you my experience with approximately 50 patients undergoing this procedure. Uh, they all had three stage same day surgery. Uh, the posterior fusion was generally T10 or 11 to the sacrum. Uh, three patients had T3 to the sacrum fusions, and the anterior was always below the diaphragm and either L2 or L3 
through the sacrum. Uh, five patients had central canal stenosis and required decompression by laminectomy over several levels. Uh, this is, is an, an all-day procedure, a little over seven hours. The group's age is 55 to 75. There's a predominance of females. Uh, it can ble be a bloody procedure. Uh, and the uh, mean ICU days afterwards were, were three. <coughs> uh, no patient was immobilized with a brace or a cast. Uh, the hospital stay averaged nine, and the follow-up in this group averaged 48 with a minimum of 40 months follow-up. Uh, this is, the, the, the scoliosis was modest. Uh, the two curves averaged 35 and 15 degrees, and that's a bending film on the right. And these were pretty well completely corrected to uh, five or seven degrees at last follow-up. And the lumbar lordosis was uh, pretty much absent before, averaging five degrees. And uh, afterwards, the average was 33 degrees, and no one had lordosis less than 23 degrees. And I think this is uh, my biggest error, is not producing enough lordosis. And this probably is not enough lordosis on this x-ray, and will probably develop a junctional problem sometime down the line. The complications, there were no neurologic and no infections. Two patients had pulmonary embolism, and I think three had lordosis less than 30 degrees, uh, two who had lumbosacral pseudoarthrosis and reoperation. Minor complications almost always happen. The SF36 outcomes were generally satisfactory <coughs> in 80%, 20%. Uh, were not satisfied uh, for a number of reasons, either insufficient pain relief, uh, inadequate lordosis, or too great expectations. This is the history of a, of a typical patient. This lady is 60 years old, uh, active, healthy. Uh, she had recently noted a change in shape, increasing low back pain, and inability to, to do what she wanted to do. She was una unable to walk more than one block, generally due to fatigue. She had had every conservative treatment you could think of. She had really no comorbidities, and her parents both lived beyond their 80s, and she was, was quite unhappy. Uh, physical exam was really pretty unremarkable. And this is her radiology. She has a fairly significant curve and very significant rotation seen on the close-up, and a fractional lumbosacral curve. These are her bending films, and the lateral shows general loss of lordosis. Uh, the sagittal MRI shows general spondylosis. L5-S1 is not as badly affected, but it certainly isn't normal. And the axial L3-4 shows stenosis, and L4-5 shows fairly significant stenosis. So after a discussion of the risk and benefits and pros and cons of surgery, she elected to have a surgical procedure. And this was uh, the Ponte procedure, T12 to the sacrum, uh, decompression by laminectomy at the stenotic levels, anterior fusion L2 to the sacrum, and posterior T12 to the sacrum done three stages, same day. And this is her post-operative appearance. She's now approximately two years and has maintained her alignment very well. And I think uh, quite satisfactory lordosis has been produced also. And she's quite happy with her procedure, has resumed most of her activities, and would, would very much do this again were she in, in the same position. Uh, so we, we are able to produce satisfactory outcomes. Uh, the last few minutes, I'll uh, touch upon a few questions regarding the surgical treatment of de novo lumbar scoliosis. And I think de decompression is, is a decision that has to be made on an individual basis, and you have to rely on the history, uh, the 
uh, the myelogram CTE in conjunction with the MRI to determine the presence of uh, central stenosis requiring formal laminectomy or lateral recess stenosis, which may be managed simply by realignment. Okay, when, when do we stop at the lower thoracic spine? I think if the, th if the thoracic kyphosis is normal, and I used to say less than 50, probably less than, less than 40 or 45 degrees, and when you can compensate in the sagittal plane and bending films are useful to determine that, that sagittal bending films. And here we see her AP uh, and uh, the lateral initially, thoracic kyphosis relatively normal and she's compensated quite well and has a good outcome. When is it necessary to extend to the proximal thoracic spine and probably when the kyphosis is more than 50 degrees and when they can't compensate on bending. And this is a generally global kyphosis, and I don't think there's much question that this needs to be extended up to T2 or T3, which makes a relatively large, long day, and one may want to stage this. When do you stop at L5? Uh, and my position is, is almost never. Uh, I suppose if you have completely normal MRI, negative discogram at lumbosacral junction in a relatively young patient, you uh, could consider stopping at lumbar five. Uh, I think the incidence of eventual degeneration of L5S1 at five and seven or 10 year follow-up is going to be very high. So what are surgical failures related to? Uh, and we've alluded to most of these. This is decompensation of thoracic spine, insufficient lordosis, failure to include the lumbosacral junction, short coronal instrumentation, and the development of lumbosacral pseudoarthrosis. And this is an example of decompression, decompensation of the thoracic spine. This was done, T lifts were done distally, and we see the thoracic spine is not too bad to start with, but decompensates into kyphosis, requiring extension proximally. Lumbosacral pseudarthrosis uh, is going to lead to a bad result. This is preoperatively, postoperatively to approximately thoracic four, and uh, anterior procedures were done distally with, which, with which what I thought was really good, good alignment. Unfortunately, uh, lumbosacral pseudoarthrosis ensued requiring revision. And most of the x-rays I've shown have, have shown only S1 fixation and it would be pretty much my routine to put uh, iliac fixation in in addition to uh, S1 fixation. And I would also use uh, bone morphogenic protein anteriorly in the disc spaces and this is after the revision uh, with S1, S2 fixation and iliac fixation on one side and a satisfactory result. So in, in summary, the treatment condition considerations involve segmental instability, spinal canal compromise, either structural or functional, the presence of deformity, curve patterns, and the spine behavior above the anticipated level of instrumentation. I think the three-stage same-day surgery for me meets the biomechanical needs. Uh, it counters the pathomechanics, is safe, and uh, I still think this is the best approach. So de novo scoliosis, the restoration of the sagittal profile is probably the most important part of the procedure. So thank you for your attention again. Thank you for a nice lecture. Now we are going to open the discussion and question.
아쪽으로 나와 보세요. 자기 소속을 말씀하시고요. Uh, I'm Dr. Lee from uh, Dongguk University. Uh, uh, those pictures you showed about the correction of uh, a kyphotic angle spinal deformity was uh, were very uh, impressive. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I believe uh, when you spoke here is totally about the uh, mechanical or biomechanical uh, point of view. Uh, in terms of uh, neurological uh, uh, perspective, I believe as a neurosurgeon, uh, too much or too rapid correction of a spinal curvature deformity has a possibility to damage the spinal cord or each nerve root. So uh, my question is, uh, when you do that huge operation, uh, uh, have you had any uh, neurological complication? And uh, 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 to avoid that, uh, uh, are you gonna use or are you using a, a Interoperative monitoring or uh, like uh, uh, evoke potential? You know, I, I think the, the huge operation you referred to is, is primarily reserved where you have no other choice. And uh, the two patients that I showed had already profound myelopathy and were uh, on their way to com complete paraplegia with, without some type of procedure. Uh, and, and your choices there are uh, relatively limited. It can be simply anterior decompression and strut grafting uh, with a posterior instrumentation with, uh, with, with no correction, which is, is probably uh, maybe the safest way to, to go. Uh, Dr. Kim yesterday evening presented a series, and he got, he had a paraplegia develop in a, in a basically an in situ procedure, so that's not without risk either. And I couldn't agree with you more that the the risk in the face of high grade para, paraparesis and deformity is high. Uh, I think if you're if one is experienced in this and uh, pay attention to, to many, many details, you can successfully uh, accomplish decompression of the spinal cord and a, a considerable correction of the deformity with an acceptable risk. Uh, we have, I, I, one of the patients I showed you in the first lecture had, had worsening of his neuro, neurology immediately after the procedure and uh, he got better and then he got worse with epidural hematoma. Uh, so, yes, you will get neurologic uh, worsening, but again, if you're careful and be sure there's no compression to the dura at any, at any place, I think that the risk is acceptable. As far as, as, as monitoring, we use uh, somatosensory evoked potentials and motor evoked potentials. And in the patient who is already myelopathic, uh, monitoring is probably not very reliable. So we always rely on wake-up test uh, when any major correction of the spine is done. And the other thing that one needs to do is to be sure that the blood pressure is, is artificially elevated to uh, probably mean of, of 90 millimeters of mercury. This, will ensure that the optimal blood supply to the spinal cord is maintained during manipulation of the spine. Okay, Dr. Kim. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Schreffelberger. Uh, Kim from Samsung Medical Center, Seoul, Korea. And uh, I'm encountered with a degenerative lumbar kyphosis patient rather than scoliosis patient. Is uh, the principle of treatment is same as degenerative scoliosis or? Uh, yeah, I would think the principle would, would would be the same. I would think you would need generally longer fusions than with gener with degenerative scoliosis, and I think you you may want to add a a pedicle subtraction osteotomy uh, or two, depending on the degree of kyphosis. But I think I would uh, approach it basically the same way. Okay, thank you. And one more question is, uh, how do you get the 
uh, graft material from the iliac bone or the local lumbar uh, We it, d During the, the first posterior approach, we'll, play, we'll uh, do the various osteotomies, place the screws, and take an iliac graft at that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question. I'm Dr. Zhang from Seoul National University. My question is that the osteogenesis imperfecta is notorious for poor bone healing. So you showed us what case of osteogenesis uh, imperfecta. So in that case, how do you get the solid bone fusion? Well, I, I think osteogenesis imperfecta heals very well. E even, even the children, they heal fine. The bone quality is, is poor. I think a lot of this after skeletal maturity or after, after puberty is reversed. This particular girl had been on a Fosamax-like drug for, for four years and her bone quality was actually pretty good. Okay, thank you. If you have any question, uh, discussion during the coffee break, please. Letter of Appreciation, Harry L. Schoffelbarger, Clinical Professor, Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation, University of Miami School of Medicine. On behalf of the Seoul National University College of Medicine, I take a great pleasure in presenting you this letter of appreciation in acknowledgement of your lectures, Biomechanics of Spinal Instrumentation and Postural Surgical Treatment of Scoliosis, given to the audiences of Neurosurgery Update 2006 at this college, March 18, 2006, Hugh Chang Wang, Dean Seoul National University College of Medicine. Coffee break. 갖고 마지막 세션을 시작하도록 하겠습니다. <웃음>